Amen. What a joy. What a joy and what a joy it is to be back with you guys and to be able to worship with you. Thank you uh, so much for your warm and gracious reception. Brother Gary and choir, thank you so much for the music. Brother Jack Nash, my goodness, God bless you, brother, and thank you so much for praying for us. I thank the Lord for your pastor and for his family and pray the Lord use them today. Eleven years ago today, I left the uh, pastorate. I was pastoring in Mississippi at that time to go on the road full-time, and for these past 11 years, we have traveled full-time. And beginning next Sunday, we're going to go back to the pastorate in North Carolina. So we're moving 1,000 miles from home, and we're doing it as we speak. So I'm not uh, responsible for anything that I say or do today. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Our moving truck left out Thursday, and we made our way here, uh, leaving Louisiana late Friday and on to here, and then... Uh, Following the service, we're going to North Carolina to get settled in and begin there next Sunday. So thank you so much, church, for your prayers. Now, are you glad you're here today? Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Since we're here, why don't we have church? Is that a deal? And why don't we ask the Lord to speak to us? I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel, and I want you to go with me to chapter 37. It is a very familiar passage, Ezekiel 37, and I want us to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts And to reveal himself to us. Would you stand as we give honor to the reading of our Lord's word. Ezekiel 37 today beginning in verse number 1. Ezekiel 37 and verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord. And set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. And caused me to pass by them round about. Behold there were very many in the open valley and lo... They were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and Cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to his bone. And when I beheld lo the sinews and the flesh came up upon them and the skin covered them but there was no breath in them. Now before I continue reading I want to stop there and ask all of us a question. Who in this room believes that what I'm reading to you today is the Word of God? All right? Who in this room believes that what I've just read to you happened exactly as I just read it to you? Now, what you believe will determine how you behave. And if you really, deep down in your being, believe that we serve a God that can take dead bones and speak to them and bring them back to life, then you'll have no problem whatsoever believing that he can do anything that needs to be done in your life, in your home or marriage, in your family or community, in this church, yea, in this nation. So I want to just ask us all a question. Uh, y'all, y'all be seated in just a minute, all right? So just hang on there. I got to stand the rest of the service, all right? So don't get in a rush. Don't quit before I do. You still awake? Say Amen. If we really believe we serve a God that can do this, why then do we live such defeated lives, walking around with our head buried in the sand as if our God is dead and as if He can no longer do anything? We pray such small prayers and even doubt that God can do what we're asking. We must understand this morning and recognize that we're praying to a big God who can do anything and therefore we should be encouraged to pray big prayers and believe God to do it. Now all my life, I've been told as a Baptist what God cannot do. I've had enough of it. I want to start hearing what God can do. And I want to start being encouraged to pray big prayers. We need to be encouraged not to give up or let up one bit, but to get a hold of God and believe that we serve a God that can speak to dead bones and bring them back to life again. Amen? So I just wanted to make sure I was in the right place today. Amen? Verse 9. Then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, 
Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves, and I will cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Father, we need you today to speak to us. Give us the grace to hear you and to obey you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said amen. And you may be seated. Ezekiel, as you very well know, was an unusual and unique prophet of old. God, we read in this book, would communicate his heart to him and his purposes to him in very unique and unusual and what we deem strange ways. I don't believe there is any more peculiar way for God to communicate his message and his vision to a man than what we've just read here in these verses. God takes the man of God in the spirit and brings him back to a location geographically where God had first called him 25 years prior to this episode. God causes him to be brought back to this open valley, a large valley, an open valley, and in the spirit allows him to see a valley that is full of dry bones. Dry means they're baked, they're bleached. These are dry bones. Now it is very obvious the scene that is unfolding before the man of God's eyes of an army that had been slain in battle. They were not given the decency of a proper burial, but rather their bodies were allowed to rot and decompose in the open valley. Ezekiel, the man of God, says that the Lord allows him to pass by. In other words, a bird's eye view to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, as far as... As the eye could see, Ezekiel saw an open valley full of bones. And then God asked a question. Can these bones live? Now you must understand, ladies and gentlemen, that any time God asks a question to man in the Bible, it is not because he needs man to be his counselor. It is not because God does not know the answer. God asks questions always for our purposes and for our benefit. So he asked the man of God, can these bones live? Now it's Sunday morning, it's February the 15th, and we're all gathered together to worship the Lord. And if we're not careful, we're tempted to put our Sunday go-to-meeting face on, and we're tempted to act super spiritual. But if you're really being judgment day honest today, had you been backed in a corner and asked by God, can these bones live? I believe you would have answered the same as I, not on your life. But I want you to know, when you factor God out, it is impossible. But when you look to God, all things are possible. I like Ezekiel's answer. He wasn't attempting to counsel the Lord. He wasn't attempting to become God. He just simply said, Lord, you know that's always the right answer. Can I get an amen from anyone? Four things very quickly I want to look at as it relates to this vision that Ezekiel, the prophet of God, received from our Lord. Firstly, I want to talk about the explanation of the vision. By that I mean let's just go through it and let's set the stage and see the background and see what's going on. The Lord asked him, Son of man, can these bones live? Lord, he replied, you know. God now instructs him to preach to the bones. Prophesy unto the bones. How's that, Lord? Prophesy unto the bones. Excuse me? Preach to the bones. Now, I don't know about you, but had I been Ezekiel, I believe I'd have done a double take and I'd have looked around to see who was looking at me. Can I get an amen? Preach to bones. Some Bible teachers tell us that you'll know the will of God because the will of God always makes sense. Can I tell you nothing can be further from the truth? The will of God very seldom makes sense at first in our lives. Preach to bones. Does that make sense to you? Does not make a lick of sense to me. It defies human logic. It defies human rationale and reasoning and understanding. Preach to bones? 
others tell us the will of God, my friends, will never make you look silly. God will never call you to get out of your comfort zone or make you do anything that causes you to look foolish. By others, preaching to bones, a boneyard, me, preach to bones. Man of God, preach to the bones. Now, I've been called to preach in some unique and unusual places. But I don't know that I've ever been called upon to preach to dead bones. But you know, come to think of it, <laughs> on second thought, I believe I have. Well, Father, what am I to say to... Let me ask you a question. If God called you to preach to dead bones... What on earth would you say? You're going to download a sermon off the internet for that? I'm going to preach them a sermon series. God says you tell them that I'm going to cause breath to come into them. You tell them what I'm telling you to tell them. And so Ezekiel, I don't know if this is how it happens, but Ezekiel cleared off a space, looked around, and he reared. But can you, can you see him? Is anyone in this room awake? Can you see him? Out in an open valley, man of God rearing back, and he's doing exactly as God instructs him. He's preaching to dead bones. Suddenly, we're told, as he was prophesying, as he was preaching, there was a noise and then a shaking. Now, I don't know about you, but some of us in the room scare easily. My biggest fear, I'm going to go on record and confess, are snakes. I do not like Snakes. The only good snake is a dead snake. Can anyone help me out in the house? And I'm telling you, I don't care for them. If you've got one at your home, bless your heart. That's all I've got to tell you. We'll pray for you. But I'm not much on snakes. But here is the man of God in the open valley. He's preaching to dead bones. And while he preaches, there's a noise. And then there's a shaking. And then we're told bone comes together to its part. Then we're told about sinews and flesh and skin tendons, ligaments, dermis, epidermis, and right before, are you getting this? Right before, I don't think you guys are listening to a word I'm saying today, amen? I'm telling you about a God that told the prophet to go out to a boneyard and preach, and as he preached, all of a sudden, dead bones start coming back together. I know you're hearing the song, <laughs> ankle bone connected, I, I know you're getting it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the bones start coming back together. Are you listening to this? And then there's ligaments and tendons and dermis and epidermis. And before his eyes, that which was previously dead, hopeless, it's now brought back together and it's now standing on its feet what resembles a great army. But there was no breath in them. And now God speaks to the prophet and he says, I want you to prophesy to the wind in the Hebrew, ruach. And I want you to prophesy for the wind to come breathe upon these slain that they may live. So the man of God does exactly as God instructs him to do. And right before his eyes, the Spirit of God comes to live within them. And now, where there was previously death, <laughs> there's life. Can these bones live? Well, you better believe they can. Because with God, all things are possible. And with God, dead things. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know some of you don't want to be accused of being a charismatic, but trust me, you're in no danger of anyone calling you charismatic. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and I want you to know right now, we serve a God that can speak to dead bones and breathe life into them and bring them back together. Do you believe that? Amen. Now, that's the explanation. Go with me secondly now to the interpretation. Many times we read obscure passages like this and we're left to scratch our head and we go away in wonderment and amazement. What does it mean? God, what are you trying to say? Lord, what are you trying to speak to my heart? What does this mean? But you don't have to search long or hard to find the real meaning and intent of this. Notice verse 11. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. What does this represent? God clearly tells us in his word. It represents the whole house of Israel. This was a dark day for Israel. This was a hopeless and bleak day for Israel. Do you understand? They had been cut off. I want you to understand they were desolate. 
and God was bringing the man of God back to this valley to give him a visual picture. Are you listening? Of what the nation of Israel was like. And just as these bones were dead, just as it was impossible, just as it was hopeless, just as there was nothing humanly that could be done to breathe life into these bones, God was communicating to the man of God, such is the case for the nation of Israel. Such is the case for your beloved people and my beloved people. Can these bones live? Can the nation of Israel live again? Can God bring life? life out of death? Can God bring life into dead bones? Yes. Can God breathe life into a dead nation that's cut off and is in a dark time in her history and in peril? And can God bring her back again? You better believe it. And God is communicating to the man of God just as I can breathe life into those bones. You're sitting here thinking the nation of Israel is over and it's cut off. I want you to know it's not over till I say it's over. And when you read the word of God, you'll discover that in order for Israel to be cut off and destroyed, God would have to be killed, and that will never happen, and God will keep his promises to his chosen people. Now, not everyone today, unfortunately, agrees with that. And not everyone today believes that the Jews of today have anything to do with the Jews of what we read in the word of God. Not everyone agrees today with eschatology and biblical prophecy in the book of Revelation and that God is going to accomplish and carry out His purposes for His chosen people and His promises for His chosen people. And when you get to preach, you preach it your way, but I'm preaching today. Can I get an amen? And I want you to know God is going to keep His word to His beloved people and His chosen people. And I want you to know He is not finished with Israel. He is going to accomplish His purpose for Israel. And just as these bones came back together and externally there appeared to be life, but internally they were devoid of the Spirit of God, such is the case for Israel even now as they've returned to their native homeland, but internally they are dead. But I want you to know just as the story ends with breath coming in and revitalization happening, are you hearing me? That's exactly what God's going to do with his chosen people. Who believes that today? Say amen. Amen. Thirdly, I want to move on now and talk about the applications. Now I need you to listen to this. There is one interpretation. This relates to the nation of Israel. Make no mistake about it. But there are numerous applications. I'll highlight a few. You could think of many more that you could add on your own. There is one interpretation, make no mistake, this relates to the nation of Israel, how she was in a dark, desolate time in her life and God was promising to the man of God, I'm going to bring her back and I'm going to restore her and breathe life into her. Listen, but now there are numerous applications. Let's talk about a few. Firstly, there's the resurrection of the dead. I want you to know as the man of God was preaching, there was a noise and there was a shaking and bone came together. I want you to understand it reminds me of a time when the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ are going to rise first. Now I understand that I'm... I'm probably going out there on a limb and I'm understanding that I'm in a growing minority of people even among Baptists these days. I want you to know I never ever in my life thought that we'd live to see a day where there's such such hostility towards the return of the Lord and toward the preaching of the rapture of the church. And maybe not everyone in this room believes in the rapture and agrees in the rapture. I want to go on record and tell you I can love you and I can fellowship with you if you do not believe in the rapture. I would expect nothing less but the same in return for me because I do believe in the rapture. Now if you don't believe in the rapture I can love you. I just pray the Lord allows me to stand right next to you when the trumpet sounds. Can I get a witness? I'm not writing books trying to push and peddle information on you to convince you you're wrong and change your mind. Why is there such a move on people's part to want to change our mind? Because we believe in the rapture. You say, well, the word rapture is nowhere found in the Bible. You're going to have to dig a little deeper for a better argument than that, friend, because the word Bible's not in the Bible. And if your only argument for not believing in the rapture is the word's not in the Bible, then why do you keep calling it a Bible? Can I get an amen from anyone in the house? I want you to know there's going to come a day when we're going to hear the toot and we're going to scoot. Who knows what I'm talking about? And Jesus is going to return in the air for his church and just as he brought life out of death to these dead bones, there is going to come a time through the shout of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's going to be resurrection power and we're going to be with him. It is a picture of the resurrection of the dead. It is a picture of regeneration of the lost. We were all dead in our trespass and sin. The Baptist church could not bring us to life. A preacher could not breathe life into us. But I'm thankful for the resurrection power that is in the word of the living God. 
through His Word spoken to our hearts. We were quickened. We were made alive. And listen, life was brought out of death. Does anyone believe that today? Say amen. Don't you ever give up on your lost loved ones? I'm telling you today, don't you ever give up on your husband or wife? Don't you ever give up on your son or daughter or grandchildren, your niece, nephew, aunts, uncles, grandparents, neighbors? Don't you ever give up on that person? Don't you ever curse them and say they'll never change? Don't you ever make such a declaration as they're no good? They've always been that way. I want you to know their mother was that way and their mother before them and they'll always be that way. I want you to know with God all things are possible and with God He can bring life out of death and I want you to know He can resurrect anyone who hears His word and turns to Him. Aren't you grateful God reached down and saved your soul? Aren't you glad God did not give up on you and what He's done for you He can do for others? Who believes that today? Say amen. It is a picture of revival in the church. Who believes our churches need revival? Who believes this church needs revival? If you don't, if you're not willing to admit you need revival, you'll never have revival. Because as long as you see yourself as self-sufficient and content and increased with goods and in need of nothing, you'll never in desperation cry out to God to say, God, do something on my behalf. Do a work in my home and marriage and family. I want you to know we serve a God that can bring life out of death. He can take dead bones and breathe life into them and bring them back. And such is the case for our churches across our land. We need life. Is anyone listening to what I'm saying? We need a rediscovery of the Holy Spirit and of who God is. We need real, genuine, authentic revival. We need an awakening. And I want you to know God can do it. He's the only one who can do it. Quit giving up and saying it's over. You're not God. Neither am I. It's not over till he says it's over. Amen. Let me give you one other application very quickly. It is a picture, listen, of the renewal and of the revitalization of a nation. See, in the essence, that's what God's talking about here. Are you getting this? I don't understand all this mealy mouth down in the dumps. I just don't get it. I'm sorry, and I don't mean to be rude, and I don't mean to be ugly. But I just don't understand all this negativity that's going on in our churches. We curse the darkness. It's as if we've given up on our nation. It's as if we've given up on God. It's as if we've said it's over. Are you listening? You sit there and watch the news. Best thing you can do is turn that stuff off. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Now, I'm not ignoring reality that it's bad. As if any of us in this room can fix 18 trillion in debt. As if any of us in this room are smart enough and sophisticated enough to fix this. We've got to reach the end of ourselves to look to the reality that only God can fix this. But you're the ones that said you believed we serve a God that can breathe life into dead bones and bring them back on their feet again. And what you believe determines how you behave. And what I want to know is if we really believe this story and if we really believe that God is able to do this, then you please tell me why in the world we're wringing our hands in agony and despair and depression and giving up on our nation as if to say it's too hard of a feat or an accomplishment for God to turn it around. Is God going to bring revival to our nation? I'm not sure, but I want to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. What about you? And it doesn't take any sophistication or intellect whatsoever to stand up and curse the darkness and talk about how evil we are and deplorable we are and wicked we are and how we're going under. I want you to know we serve a God that can speak the word and through the word of God can bring life out of death. And in the immediate application of this passage, what you'll discover is God was showing the man of God the situation for Israel and how she was cut off and in despair and without hope and he was wanting to get across to the man of God. Can these bones live, Lord, you know? God was saying, I want you to know I can bring life out of death and I want you to know I can revive a nation that's too far gone. I'm going to preach it till you get it. So if you're not getting it, you may as well shout on credit. Can I get a witness? <laughs> Make me think you're getting it. Amen? We, we want to sit there and be negative and wring our hands. And Brother Jerry, do you see what's going on? Do you know what's going on across the land? Well, I never thought we'd live to see a day. On and on and on. And I want to look you in the eye and I want to tell you unashamedly that you think and we think it's all falling apart. 
Can I tell you something? It's all coming together. God's on his throne. Are you listening to what I'm saying? The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it with us ever he will. And the point is, we as people of God need to get a hold of God and believe God that God can speak the word and bring life out of death and can revive our nation. These are horrible days, yes. But I'll tell you this, they could be the greatest days we've ever experienced in our life because if there's ever been need for the light to shine, it's right now. Do you believe that, yes or no? If there's ever been need for a real awakening, I want you to understand, for holy God to move on the hearts and lives of people, it's right now. If there's ever been a day for us to be instruments God could use to bring revival, it's right now. Enough of playing patty cake, enough of these little games, enough of rearranging furniture. Hear me very well. These are now days where we stand firm and flat-footed on the Word of God and rather than being politically correct, want to be biblically correct and stand up and say, this is what God says and we serve a God that can bring life out of death. Amen? I'll have to amen myself, I guess. Amen? If I got to do the preaching and the amen, and we'll be here till tonight, can anyone help me out? My, my, my. The applications. Fourthly, finally, let me give you a final thought, and that's the conclusions we learn from this vision. There are at least four things I pull out of these verses that we learn in conclusion. Some of you this morning are faced with impossibilities in your own life. They tell us the three things people worry about the most in the American culture. Family, money, health. Over 70% of marriages that end in divorce in our nation list as the number one reason money. Jesus spoke more of money than he did heaven or hell combined. So perhaps the three things that keep you up late at night and cause you the most peril and stress and worry, money, family, health. Some of us in this room are faced with real calamity, real trouble, real burden, real problems. And you look around and perhaps in your own life and in your own marriage and in your own family and in your own circumstances, you see an open valley full of dry bones. And you think... It's impossible. It'll never turn around. But we learn from this passage differently. Can I get an amen? What is it going to take in your life and in my life, listen, to see dead things come back to life? Let me give you four concluding thoughts and we're finished. Firstly, it's going to take faith. Manly Beasley many years ago used to say the following. Faith is saying something is so when it is not so in order that it may become so, because God said so. Faith is taking God at His word. Faith is believing God. Son of man, can these bones live? Intellectualism could not make them live. Religion could not make them live. Economics could not make them live. Is anyone listening? All of our wit, all of our smarts could not make them live. What did the man of God answer? Lord, you know why don't instead of us cursing the darkness and saying it's impossible, why don't we just say, you know what, whether it can live or not, that's above my pay grade. But what I know is I... Mm. What I you know, I can't go to seminary and learn whether or not dead bones can live. I'm not smart enough to figure that out. But I know God. And what I do know is he has the final say. And what I do know is he can bring life out of death. And I don't care who says it can't happen. God says it can. And faith is taking him at his word. And faith is believing him. And without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Secondly, it's going to take obedience. The second principle, it's going to take obedience. Obedience. Preach to the bones. What do you do? Preach to them. What do you do? Preach to them. Brother Jerry, it doesn't make a lick of sense. God did not call you to make sense out of it. 
When God says preach, see that's the problem. That's the problem right there. Church, are you still awake? Say amen. amen. Let me highlight the problem right here among us as Baptists. If God were to speak to us today, if God were to speak to us today and say preach to bones, here's what we'd do. Now don't you dare shout me down while I'm preaching good, but you know I'm telling the truth. Here's what we'd do. Well, now you know we've got to have a meeting about it. And so church, we're going to call us into business conference. And what do you say we do? Well, you know, preacher, we've never been much on preaching to bones around here before. And I don't know where in the world we're going to get the money. I mean, we're already under budget. And I'm just telling you, I don't know where in the world, you know, the economy's tanking and I just don't know where we're going to get the money. And whenever anyone stands up and says where we're going to get the money, it is a good indication you're never going to get it from them. That's not your source. Can I get a witness? Hello, amen. So we've got to have a meeting. Is that how we would do it? Yes or no? I'm asking you, is that how we would do it? So we've got to have a meeting. I'll tell you what we do. Let's appoint an exploratory committee. They can look into, they can explore the feasibility of whether or not we at this church should preach to bones. And so they'd have meetings. And we'd be called to pray. Let's pray for the exploratory committee. And then the, yes or no? Yes or no? And so then we'd have a meeting after they've had meetings to hear their report. And their report would be, well, we just don't believe we can do that. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's all vote. Uh, we're, we're not going to preach to bones. And we miss out on seeing dead things come back to life because we talk ourselves out of it. Do you remember when God told them to march around the wall seven times? He said, don't you say a word. Do not say a word. Why? Because God knew they would talk themselves out of it. Does that make a lick? We're going to tear the wall down by marching around it? And then on the last day, march seven times and blow the trumpet and shout? Now that's a good plan, God. Amen? And somewhere along the line, we've got to be reminded that the wisdom of man is the foolishness of God. And the more talking we do, the more we get ourselves into trouble because we get focused on the flesh and the impossibilities rather than the God who's behind the impossibilities. And not most of the time, but all of the time, we will talk ourselves out of it and we'll miss out on seeing walls come down and dead bones come to life because we've got to talk. Better yet, you want to see life come out of death? When God tells you to do something, do it. Don't you sit down and add up all the pros and cons and pluses and minuses and assets. and It doesn't, listen, it doesn't make any sense that you take a dollar and you give a dime to God and he'll make 90 cents go further than 100 cents. That defies all human logic and rationale. That's why 80% of Baptists do not do it. Hello, somebody. Amen, Brother Jerry. Good preaching. That's why 80% of Baptists do not do it. Because you talk yourself out of it. Because you sit down and you figure it all up and you add it off and it doesn't make sense. And it does, it, you know what? It'll never work out on paper. You've just got to give a dime on every dollar to God and trust Him. And know that if He's big enough to get you out of hell and get you into heaven, He is big enough to take 90 cents and stretch it and go further than 100 cents. And if you don't believe it, try Him and see what He'll do. Amen? And until you've tried it, you sit there and roll your eyes all you want to. Now, I'm not the pastor of this church, so I can't say this here. But when I used to pastor, here's what I always said. If you're not a tither, if you're robbing God, you start tithing today. You do it for 13 Sundays, and if at the end of 13 Sundays you can stand before the church and say that it doesn't work, we'll refund you 100% of your money. And never one taker in all the years I pastored. Can I get an amen? You want to know why? Because God says, try me, try me. Try me, try me, try me, try me. Put me to the test. Put me. Hey, when God says, I double dog dare you, you better rear back and trust him. Amen? What's it going to take to see life come out of death? Obedience. When God says do something, do it. Thirdly, we're almost done. It's going to take the word of God. What did he say do? Speak the word. Prophesy the word. 
preach the word. Preach the word. Enough of my ideas and your ideas and political parties and persuasions. Preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. Amen? Preach the word of God. I don't mean to be ugly. I don't mean to be ugly. But if all we needed was another cute little clever talk to bring revival, we'd have had revival already in this nation because we've had a bunch of that. Can I get an amen from anyone? I'm telling you, whatever happened to just opening the Bible, letting God speak, letting God be true, and every man a liar. Thank God you have a pastor with integrity who stands on the Word of God. Thank God for him. Amen? Amen. Preach the Word of God. Preach the Word of God. Stand on the Word of God. Stand on the Word of God. Life out of death when you speak the Word of God. Fourth and finally, and we're finished, it's going to take the Holy Spirit. Now that's where we Baptists get nervous. Why are we Baptists so afraid of the Holy Spirit? I've never been able to figure it out or understand. I do not understand why. He said, look, I want you to prophesy to the wind. Prophesy to the Spirit that it would come and breathe and be slain. And he did, and the Spirit did, and they were alive. All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Why are we so afraid of the Holy Spirit? Would you like me to be honest with all of us and give us the answer? It's because we are afraid of losing control. And the thing about that that is so rather humorous to me is how little in control we really are. And yet we boast and brag that I'm in control. For years I have preached that revival always has happened with younger people. Historically, if you study revival, you will discover that every revival, every awakening, every one started with younger people. Many times on college campuses where younger people would rise early to gather to pray and cry out to God for an awakening. Every revival has happened with younger people. Now I have preached that for years. Revival typically happens with younger people. And suddenly months ago as I was preaching that, it was as if the Spirit of the Lord smote my heart and I stopped and asked this question, why does it always happen with younger people and why does it very rarely happen with older people because I'm no longer in the younger category. Do you agree that it would do us a lot of good to get the answer to that question? And the Lord whispered to my heart, and here's what he said to me. He said, because Jerry, when you were younger, you were willing to do anything. No strings attached. You signed the bottom of a blank sheet of paper. You wanted me to fill in the blanks. And as you start getting older, you start getting attachments. Well, you got land and a house and stuff. 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 We got a whole truckload of stuff being moved right now. Half of which I'm scratching my head and asking, why do we even have it? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? If we died, our kids would have a garage sale, get rid of it for as little as they could. Yes or no? Stuff, junk, attachments. Well, I got a deer lease. I got a four-wheeler, jet ski. I got a boat. I got a vacation home. I've got kids and grandkids. I've got family. I've got stuff. I've got hobbies. I'm attached. I still know right intellectually. I believe right. But I tell you when it comes to my heart and will, I have attachments. And whereas years ago, I was willing to lay it all on the altar. And so I got on my knees and I said, Lord, I want to practice what I preach. And I want to desperately have revival in my own life and in my own home. And I want my kids to see real revival and not hear stories and read stories out of books of how God used to move. Are you listening to what I'm telling you? And Lord, I want to be an instrument you'd be willing to use to bring revival. And I want to lay it all at your feet, just like I did when I was a youngster. All again, I want to sign up. I want to re-enlist. I want to sign the bottom of a blank sheet of paper. You fill in the blanks. I want to let go. No strings attached. You do what you want. Have your way. Have your way. I don't want to become another old, stale, crusty, has been, that looks in the rearview mirror, talking about the good old days. And for me, this doesn't mean this is what will happen to you, but for me, 
God said, okay, sell your house, uproot your family, say goodbye, and move a thousand miles. And I can hear in this room, in your mind, the battle of what could possibly happen if God told all of us to do it. And God may not want you to move across the street, much less a thousand miles. But if you're unwilling, then quit coming in here talking about you want revival. Because until the Spirit of God has the freedom to do whatever He wants to do in our life, and you know what, listen, can I be honest? It's easy to talk, and I'm confessing to you. It's another thing to just follow through. It preaches good from the pulpit. I'm, tell, I'm admitting that to you as a preacher. But God constantly has to put me in check and say, you obey what I'm telling you. When the Spirit of God is in control, the man of God or woman of God is never out of control because the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And you can trust the Holy Spirit. But you'll never see dead bones come back to life without the Holy Spirit. You and I are not smart enough to make that happen. And we're not smart enough to turn this church, this nation, or our family around. But God can do it with one word. But He's looking for vessels who will believe Him, who will obey Him, who will stand on the Word, who will be yielded to the Spirit. Who believes this today? Now I've got a question. We're going to pray. We're done. It's over. You in your own life perhaps are faced with real, real, real difficulties. I mean, to you it would be as if you're glancing out of the valley and it's full of dead bones. I can't tell you the people that come to me after church and with tears rolling down their face share with me the things in their lives that are seemingly impossible. Preacher, I've got a grandson in prison. I've got a, I've got a child that's on meth. Preacher, I, I, I've, I've got a marriage that's failing. Brother Jerry, I just don't know how we're going to make On and on and on. But we all said at the beginning of this service that we believe that this is the Word of God and that that happened what we read just as God said. So I'm asking you today, I'm asking you this morning, in the name of Jesus, do you really deep down in your heart believe that we have a God that can do anything? Do you really, deep down in the core of your being, but really believe that we serve a God that can take dead bones and bring them back to life? And He can do the same in your home, and your marriage, with your children, and your family, in this church, and community, and in this nation. Do you really believe it? I'm asking you, do you really believe it? Then if you do, get a word from Him. Stand on it. Do what He tells you. Stand on the Word of God. Yield to the Holy Spirit. And allow Him to use you as an instrument to bring revival. Can I get an amen from anyone? Amen? We were having an offering several years ago at church. My little boy went in his room between the Sunday morning and the Sunday evening service. And at that time, he had one of those trifold Velcro wallets. Do you know what I'm talking about? You, and that, that little boy was so proud of it. And he came out, and that wallet was that thick. And I said, Luke, what are you doing? And he said, well, I've, I, I was putting my money in my wallet. And I think he had about $143, most of which was dollar bills that he had gotten from birthday money and different things, and he crammed it in his wallet, couldn't even get it to close. Do you see the picture? And I said, what are you doing? And he said, Daddy, they said this morning that tonight at church we're taking an offering. And I said, Luke, are you giving all your money? And he said, well, Dad, I don't know if I'm giving all of my money, but I know this, you've got to be willing to give it all in case God tells you to. And I don't know what God's going to call you or me to do. But I know we've got to be willing to give it all in case He tells us to. He wants our heart. He wants us. Amen?